Okay, so I'm going to talk about developing your curriculum. Okay, so we know what service learning is, right? Service learning is what? You just let them go do community service and that's the end of it? Is that service learning? No, you have an interactive experience and it's aligned with your course goals, the objectives of the course, right? So the first thing you need to consider is how will you incorporate service learning? Okay, that's the first thing. And so one of the things you can look at, is it going to be discipline based? Okay, so we have a number of disciplines here. We heard math, I mean, excuse me, biology, Anna said math. Um, I think I heard pathology, um, social work, business, a number of different disciplines. So how will you incorporate it? Will it be something that you gain content knowledge for your course or is it to solve a problem? Okay, we have a number of societal issues as we know, so could it be how your particular discipline solves a problem in particular? Okay, and all of this is going to come together and connect with the type of community partner that you choose, which I believe um, Anna will talk about as well. All of it, a lot of this that we're talking about overlaps and it kind of intertwines, like putting the pieces of a puzzle together. Um, another one is a capstone course. We know that that's a culminating experience for all the courses that a student takes throughout their matriculation at an institution. And what's really becoming popular is community-based action research. Okay, a lot of you here are researchers. And service learning can be incorporated into a course doing community-based action research. I heard someone say they were in um, early childhood education. Okay, so if you go into the community, you could have um, your students conducting research, maybe it's for a daycare center, UAB has a child development center, so maybe they need a need met and they conduct research and they integrate the community, the parents, um, the students. So that's another way to incorporate service learning. And then lastly, in regards to how you incorporate it, is it mandatory or is it optional? Okay, and some people may think, I mean, but I'm doing service learning. Of course it's going to be mandatory. I'm the teacher. I'm telling them what they do. Not necessarily. There's some instances where an instructor may choose to have a service learning component of their class, and they may allow students to decide whether or not they would like to participate in that. One way to kind of combat any confusion is to maybe relinquish them from having to complete an assignment if they do service learning course, okay? And that service learning participation substitutes for a particular assignment or a number of assignments. What's important to know is just because you're doing service learning does not mean that you change the academic rigor of your course, okay? It's not just a simple add-on that you just throw <laughs> together and it's not that you water down your course. It actually enhances the learning because they're actually applying what they learn in the classroom, which brings me to my next set of points, the syllabus. Okay, how many of you in here say that you've taught classes? I know it's about maybe half taught or are teaching. Okay, and the other half of you that may have not taught classes, you've all taken classes, right? You're affiliated with the institution. And the one thing that you constantly refer back to throughout the semester as a student is your syllabus. Even as an instructor, I'm a social work educator and I constantly refer to my syllabus because you know that that is the contract between you, the instructor, and those students. So when doing that, you have to pay attention to a number of things. So we're going to refer to our handouts that we gave. I know we get, you all got multiple handouts. So we're going to look at two of the syllabi for me, and I'll have you look at the other one. You, can you pull the one that says ecotoxicology? in the top left, and the other one that says an introduction to mathematical ideas. Do you see those two? And there the syllabi has the UAB service learning logo at the top. Now we chose these syllabi strategically because you would think math and toxicology, how in the world would you incorporate service learning? And we did that intentionally. When you hear service learning, you think about what? A lot of the service disciplines, you think social work, you think education, you think maybe psychology, you, you think those types of, of disciplines, but you can very well incorporate it in a math class or ecotoxicology class. Another thing I want you to notice is, hold a, each syllabi, one in each hand. You can notice that one is much thicker than the other one, right? All of you have had classes or taught classes, or even some of your colleagues may have a syllabus that's a couple pages long. And some people think, hey, that's to the point. And some instructors think, that is absurd. How can they get what they need to know? And I've seen syllabi that are 40, 50 pages long because everything is in there. So let's look at the 
ecotoxicology syllabus first. I have highlighted at the top the course description, okay, the one that says ecotoxicology. The course description is highlighted. If you look at the last sentence, it clearly states service there is a service learning component of the course. That is the number one thing that you have to do when you develop your syllabus is ensure that the students know that the course is a service learning course. Um, to go back to your question, Annetta, about assessment and getting what students need to know, we've done surveys and someone will also talk about that at the end of the semester through a big portion of our service learning classes here at UAB. And one of the questions is, did you know this class was a service <coughs> learning class when you registered? And if this says, if no, when did you find out? And unfortunately, <laughs> if I may be candid, Libba, <laughs> we, <laughs> we did find out that some students did not know it was service learning until we walked in in December to give them that survey. Mind you, they completed the service activity. Right? They expected to get a good grade out of the class, and they had done their reflective assignments, but they didn't know it was service learning, which shows a disconnect, and no one is at fault, but we just have to do a better job at communicating certain things to our students. We had an incident recently, we were doing a discussion um, with students, and she was like, oh, service learning sounds great. I want to take a class. I'm in film. I'm in a class now. And then we were like, well, whose class are you in? And she told us the instructor's name, and we say, she teaches service learning, and I think that she's teaching one this semester. She was like, well, no, I wish I would have known because that can't be my class. So then we got confused, and we're thinking, is there more than one section of the class? And then come to find out, we were like, well, well where do you do your film assignments? Do, do you have a community partner? She was like, no, what's a community partner? And that's another thing, the language, community pro pro partner and nonprofit organization are synonymous, and sometimes it may not be a nonprofit. And so she was like, no, nah, but we go around in Birmingham, and we do film, and we work with these people and that people. We were like, you're in a service learning class. And she's like, oh. So it's very important to put that in um, your course description so students know that it is clearly service learning, OK? And you'll see in other areas of the syllabus where it's highlighted service learning, service learning, project, project, so students will know. And in addition to that, you have to look at your goals and objectives of the course, okay? And with that, your service learning component has to be tied to the goals and objectives of your course. Okay, if you're teaching a math class, you don't want the students going to a facility wiping dust off of plants and washing windows. I mean, that's a good service project because that particular facility may need that. It may be short on their budget. and may not have anyone to clean. But that has nothing to do with the math class and the goals of that particular course. So you have to concentrate on learning in addition to that. Also, the assignment should be service learning related. If you look at the other syllabus, the Introduction to Mathematical Ideas, so the students know directly that they will be working in the community. It also says, based on its needs. What did Rachel say previously? You have to make sure that you're meeting the community partner's needs. And then the instructor goes through and talks about all the different components that to need, need to be completed. Um, they can work in pairs or small groups. Now, remember I talked about whether it's mandatory or an optional. In this particular syllabus, for the sake of time, we're not going to go through every single part of it. You can, but in this particular syllabus, the service learning component was optional. This instructor allowed them to choose whether or not they wanted to participate in service learning. And the instructor also clearly delineated which assignment it would be substituted for, whether it was a test grade. Um, they allowed them to miss one class period if they chose this project. But it also stated that it's expected that you will be working on the project or meeting with your community partner when you miss that particular class. Okay? Um, and then the other section, it has project descriptions on there on page four. There's a number of uh, community partners and of different projects. And syllabi also often have um, examples of community partners in there as well. Um, also, the text and the readings. A lot of times, of course, is some students read, some students don't. Some instructors put a very, very, very significant emphasis on reading the text and assignments. And of course, in a perfect world, we want all of our students to read. Um, and that's why service learning is also important, because not only are they reading and doing assignments, they're experiencing that and applying it in a real world setting. And so we've seen instructors that have an actual textbook 
that they use. I know um, in social work, Laurel in my field, we have textbooks that we use, but that's a big part of our um, social work education is actually going out in the field doing practicums and internships and learning um, directly. And then I've also seen instructions that instructors that pull together supplemental materials, articles, books that you can get in Barnes and Noble, maybe not a textbook, and those are the particular assi um, assignments to come from those books and readings and things like that in order to drive home the goals and the objectives that they're supposed to be getting in um, their nonprofit agency. Also a schedule. Um, the toxicology, as you know, is much thicker, so it's a lot more detailed. That syllabus actually has um, a schedule. Now this is an older syllabus, but if you look starting on page 11, it has everything, an introduction to the course, the framework. It has when um, assignments are supposed to be turned in. The math syllabus has that as well. It has the date, the final date that a project can be given back to the nonprofit agency, like the, the results of what they did with that agency. So they're very specific with the schedule and the outline. And lastly, the grading policy. We live in a day and age where students want what? What do they want? They want that A, right? <laughs> so they need to know what percentage of their service learning work will be applied to their overall course grade, okay? Um, we taught a class, an intro to social work, and they have to do 15 hours in a particular agency. And the student may get an A on every test, an A on every paper, and do an exceptional job. So that student will think, hey, I'm going to get an A. If that student did not complete all of those hours and those reflections and get their information signed by that nonprofit that they work with, that student will not pass that class. Because that's our policy. That's in our grading policy. And that just further substantiates the fact that this service learning component is important. It's not an add-on. It's not just something that you can choose to do because it was mandatory in that class. So the policy about how the service learning assignments, the hours that they're doing, that needs to also be clearly delineated as well in there. Okay? And then next, we'll, Anna will be talking about how you can align service learning with your course goals better. When you choose a service learning project, you want to make sure that it does align with all of the course goals you've outlined. You don't want to choose a project that is kind of out in left field, it's just a random volunteer experience. You want to make sure that it is providing your students with that enriched uh, learning experience that we think service learning will and should provide. And one example of a project that didn't align with course goals is we had, we reached out to one community partner about a partnership and the only opportunity they had that semester was counting beans and that really wouldn't align with any class. So again, no random volunteer work that can be beneficial in a different setting, but it won't enhance their learning experience in that particular class. So an example of this, if you uh, pull the syllabus that has community nutrition at the top. This is a syllabus, and again, this is like Jessica talked about, a very thorough syllabus. This teacher has 18 course goals outlined for her students. We're going to talk about the first three because 18 is a lot. So number one says the students will be able to describe the expanding role of the community dietitian. And then number two, understand and articulate nutrition problems and practices in the community. And then finally, describe the skills needed to deliver nutrition services. So in this class, she, this teacher wants a project that will meet all of those needs outside of the classroom. So the students have talked about it in class. They've addressed all these issues from their textbook in a lecture style. And now the teacher wants them to go out into the community and learn these things in a more hands-on experience. And sometimes we find that in service learning, that question you can often get as a teacher, what am I going to do with this? When am I ever going to use that? Can be answered in a service setting because they'll see, oh, here's where I use what we talked about for a whole week in class. Well, here's why it's necessary. So based on these uh, course descriptions, does anybody have an idea of what a good project might be, whether in Birmingham or just a fictional idea? Any suggestions? It's a nutrition class. They want to learn about nutrition and what dietitians do. Yes? I'm wondering if um, you could hook up with a gym that actually has a dietitian on board that's working with potentially, so a gym setting, or I'm thinking home health agency, or potentially, or maybe even a hospital, depending on if they can, if they have the regulations become a real nightmare sometimes. 
Right. Those are all great suggestions, though. And if you flip over to some of the latter pages in the syllabus, page four and five and six, this teacher has outlined the projects that her students have previously worked on. And several of those ideas, a gym, a local health agency, are people that they partner with. So um, one is the Good Neighbors, Inc. So they offer on-site help and do presentations, all those sort of things. So those students are going to see as they work with people, the issues that they are really having. And you know as a teacher that sometimes when you hand out a test, you'll have 15 students come and ask you the exact same question and then you realize, okay, this is something that we really need to address. That's something similar that they're gonna see as they work with these people because they may have learned like the six main nutrition issues that a community faces and then when they go out and serve and have one issue that comes to them 20 times over the course of 10 minutes, they've really learned, okay, this is an issue, and this is why I've learned this in class. And another example we have right here at UAB of a course that uh, initially the service learning goal didn't align with the course, but we uh, flipped it around so that it would, but Nursing 336 is a nursing leadership class at UAB that's required for all nursing students, and they wanted the, the course to be a service learning course. And initially, the goal was just to have students doing some general volunteer work that would be incorporated into the class. But when we started reaching out to community partners, and they needed a lot because they've got 120 students, so they needed about 18 community partners, we found that the opportunities that were out there did not incorporate those leadership skills. Though they were doing great volunteer work, they weren't utilizing the leadership skills they were learning in class. So we kind of reanalyze how we were going to do this, what would be more beneficial to really aid those students in what they were learning. And we decided that instead of just going to volunteer, they would plan a supply drive or um, some kind of drive for a community partner, plan it all themselves, implement it, go and deliver it to the community partner and see the people that they've served and benefited. And that was much more beneficial to these students in helping them utilize these leadership skills that they were learning. And then next, which goes right along with this, is how to find that right community partner that does have an opportunity. And as they're yes. working with people in the community, those people are going to have a diverse range of questions that the students are going to have to figure out how to address and how to meet the community's needs. So we find that those types of experiences are what really help the student increase their understanding and their learning and provide that enriched learning experience rather than just sitting in a lecture and writing down those facts and looking over them here and there at night. They've got to uh, use them to help others and the community. So that's what we find creates that learning experience. It's a community. Community or people will accept getting knowledge from students, I mean from undergrads. Did you have some experience where students are going to public libraries <coughs> to get something like clubs or journal clubs or something like that? We have not had um, any issues with the community being unreceptive to students and that's mainly because we do have a community partner that is facilitating this project and supervising so it's not the students just on their own. They are being advised and um, being told this is what does work, this is what doesn't, so we haven't had that issue. Any other questions? So next we'll talk about how to find that right community partner that will have a project that incorporates your learning goals. So the best community partner, as we've talked about, should have a project that fits with your service learning and class objectives. Again, you don't want your students counting beans if you don't have a class that's about counting beans. So students should be doing meaningful work that enhances both their classroom learning and is beneficial to the community partner. You want to make sure that your partner needs the services that your students will be providing. And if one partner doesn't have an appropriate opportunity, feel free to say no and keep looking. When we got the Counting Beans offer, we said, I'm sorry, no, this doesn't fit. We'll be in touch another semester if you have something different. And again, this nursing class is a great example. We ended up um, lowering the group size to only get 11 community partners, and we're able to ha find some great nonprofits in Birmingham that needed either money or resources, books, all different types of things donated that these students could do drives for. <coughs> And how to create a partnership, this is a lot of information, but we're going to go through it all. So the best way to create a partnership is to email or call the community partner's volunteer coordinator. Most nonprofits are going to have that volunteer coordinator who knows all of the opportunities that they have in place for students or anyone interested in volunteering. 
You can also reach out to our office um, for assistance and ideas. We know a lot of the local nonprofits and who's in charge over there, who we can talk to, what opportunities they already have in place. So please reach out to us if you do need help. And then when you're talking to your community partner, there are a few things you need to provide them with so they know how to help you and how you can help them. You need to tell them what kind of opportunity you're looking for and what your students are, what you're wanting your students to learn and get from the opportunity. And then dates and times and of course the number of students that they're going to need to accommodate when they're there. And all of that, they're just going to need to know. It's better not to request a specific opportunity and just instead tell them what you're hoping your students to get because they may have an opportunity that doesn't directly align with what you were thinking, but it still fits. And an example of this is Episcopal Place is a local uh, nursing home. So if you teach a class that doesn't directly benefit those people, you may not think to partner with them, but they actually have an opportunity for volunteers to walk their residents' dogs, which is something that you would not associate with Episcopal Place. So lots of different nonprofits have a variety of opportunities that can benefit all different people and your students as well.